you about today is the genomic perspective of studies to help alleviate uh, health disparities. So something that I was taught when I was a human genetics uh, PhD student at Yale was that one of the characteristics of diseases that have a genetic basis is that they differ in prevalence in ethnic groups. So these are some example of Mendelian diseases, and that means that they are caused by um, single gene disorders that differ in prevalence amongst ethnic groups. So for example, cystic fibrosis is very common in uh, European Americans, Tay-Sachs disease in Ashkenazi Jews, phenylketonuria in African Americans. But what about complex diseases? And complex diseases refers to diseases that are caused by multiple genes together with environment. So an example is hypertension. You can see from this statistic that um, hypertension is more prevalent in people of African descent in the US. If we look at the prevalence of diabetes, which is another complex uh, disorder, we can see that it's most prevalent in Hispanic populations and also in African Americans, Asian Americans, relative to people of European descent. So I do research in Africa, and that's a, reg a region where we don't see quite as much diabetes in more rural areas, but we're seeing it rapidly on the rise in urban areas. And it's estimated that by the year 2030, there's going to be 24 million people impacted by diabetes in Africa. Now that's telling us that obviously there are environmental factors that are playing a role, but that doesn't mean that there aren't also underlying genetic factors that together with environment is influencing disease risk. So for you to understand why do we see these differences in genetic uh, variants that play a role in disease risk, I have to tell you, start with human origins. And here I'm showing you these red dots represent the location of anatomically modern humans that originated in Africa. The oldest recently has been dated to about 300,000 years ago. After this origin in Africa, sometime between 50 to 80,000 years ago, there was a migration of relatively small numbers of people, could have been in the hundreds to thousands, out of Africa giving rise to all other populations. When this occurred, we call this a bottleneck because there's like a population crash when people migrated out of Africa, you get a reduction in the genetic diversity and you can get dramatic shifts in the frequency of genetic variants. This is also pronounced when you have more recent migrations, for example, into the Pacific Islands within the past 3,000 or so years. So how much do we differ? Well, in theory, identical twins, there should be no differences in genomes. If we compared any of our genomes here in this room, we differ at about one out of a thousand nucleotides. If we compare human to chimp, one out of a hundred, to mouse, one out of 30, and to broccoli, two out of three. Now, considering that there are three billion DNA bases, that means three million nucleotide variants between any pair of genomes. However, this is my funny slide of um, ethnic diversity amongst beautiful people according to Estee Lauder. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Even amongst the rest of us, <laughs> there's not that much variation as a whole. We're talking about, you know, very recent common ancestry. <clears throat> However, that's not to say that there are no differences. So this is from a recent review paper um, that was published, I think actually just last week. And it's uh, representing data from the Thousand Genomes Project. This was an NIH initiative to do whole genome sequencing, and they ended up doing actually about 2,000 individuals from globally diverse populations. In gray, they're showing the variants that are shared either in a region or globally, and you could see that that's the majority of genetic variation. And then in colors are those that are private either to a continent or to a population. And you could see that they certainly do exist, simply reflecting our evolutionary history. This was another paper that recently came out that was really shocking to me when I saw this. They did, um, looked at the number of genome-wide association studies that have been done in ethnically diverse populations. So those are studies where we look at uh, genetic variants around the genome, across the genome, and we look for an association with the disease. If you see a strong association, that implies that that genetic marker is physically linked or pretty close to that disease-causing variant or gene. So these studies in, um, I think this was 2009, 96% were in people of European descent. In 2016, it's gotten a bit better. It's at 81%. That means less than 20% of studies have been done on non-Europeans. Of those, the majority of Asians, 
only about 4% on people of African or uh, Hispanic ancestry, Native American ancestry. We have to do something about that. And for that reason, my lab and our African collaborators have been doing field work in Africa, and I wanted to show you a little bit of what that's like and some of the challenges. We could discuss that more afterwards. This is from Ethiopia in 2010. We had to bring all of our supplies with us. We are doing, this is an anthropometric setup. This is me returning results, which is something extremely important that many people don't do. These are our colleagues in Cameroon from the University of Yaoundé uh, that we're collaborating with and several people in my lab, including um, a postdoc from Cameroon, Eric Mabunwe. So in these regions, we're collecting DNA and RNA and frozen plasma from blood, and then we're getting detailed ethnographic information. And we have a challenge of how we're gonna process those in areas with um, little or no electricity. So we actually have started setting up a, a generator that's out of the screen here and setting up our laboratory in the bush. And then we look at phenotypic diversity. So that includes very detailed anthropometric measurements, height, weight, percent body fat, and so on. We look at cardiovascular lung and blood phenotypes, metabolic function, and infectious disease status. Now, one of the challenges is, how do you distinguish genetic from environmental factors that are influencing variable traits, including disease risk? One of the approaches that we are taking is to compare people of similar genetic ancestry, but living in different environments. So for example, an urban uh, versus rural environment. The other thing you could do is you could look at people of very different genetic ancestry, which is shown by these different colors here, that live in the same environment and have different risks for disease. So as an example, these are two groups in Cameroon uh, that live in a similar area. The Fulani are uh, traditionally nomadic pastoralists, and we're actively studying this population now in Cameroon. And one of the couple of unique things about that group, one is that they have a relative uh, resistance to malaria for reasons that we don't yet understand. When we were doing field work, the other thing that we noticed is that they have um, some of the highest prevalence of diabetes and hypertension that I've ever seen in rural populations in Africa. We hypothesized that might actually be tied into each other. A boosted immune response makes them resistant to malaria, but perhaps more susceptible to hypertension and diabetes. In Southern Africa, the San, who until recently were traditional hunter-gatherers, now live nearby agriculturalists, and yet they have an increased risk for TB. So I want to tell you now about um, patterns of genetic variation on a global level. This is from a study we published several years ago, but it remains the largest study to date of genetic variation across uh, African populations. And the way to interpret this is that we use probabilistic approaches to infer genetically defined ancestral populations. And they're shown by these different colors. You can see that this is made up of lines, and each line represents a person, and they can have ancestry from these different ancestral population clusters. These are the non-Africans. We can see that they're generally clustering by geographic region. People who self-identify as European or Middle Eastern are shown here in blue. Here are people from India from Pakistan, Central Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. In Africa, you could just look at all the colors, and you could see that there's a lot of genetic diversity compared to on a global level. Now, if we just zoom in on Africa, and for ease of presentation, I just merge people into these pie charts by region, but all the colors are showing you there's a lot of variation, and there's no such thing as a representative African population. The Thousand Genomes Project that I told you about, they're mainly focused on these populations that are shown with orange ancestry. They're missing a lot of diversity. So what's the cause? What's, <laughs> what resulted in all this diversity of these patterns that we see? Part of it is demographic history, large population size, historic migration events, admixture, but also natural selection. And I love this quote. This is from Darwin from On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. And he said, this preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. So this is from a review paper that my lab published in Science last year, where we looked at examples of local adaptation, local genetic adaptation to different environments. And I'm gonna step through and highlight a few of these. And the first one I'm going to mention is a genetic adaptation to lactose tolerance. So lactose tolerance, the ability to drink milk as an adult, is thought to be an adaptive trait. And it's most prevalent in populations that have a lot of dairying, drink a lot of milk. 
Very common in Northern Europe, very low prevalence in East Asia, low prevalence in Native Americans, low prevalence in most Africans except East Africans who have cattle. We did field work in Africa, in East Africa, amongst the pastoralists. We did a test of lactose tolerance, and we identified several novel genetic variants that were near the gene lactase that regulates lactose tolerance. These happen to be regulatory variants, and they arose independently from the variant influencing lactose tolerance in Europeans. They also happen to be very uh, geographically restricted in Africa. And we also saw a whopping signature of natural selection. So these in red, these are individuals who have two copies of the genetic variant associated with lactose tolerance. That variant was so increased the fitness of the people who had it such that they had more children and their children had more children and it swept to high frequency in the population. And when it did that, it dragged with it the neighboring variation. If you look at chromosomes that have the um, ancestral allele, you don't see that. That's a really whopping signature. Another example, a classic example, is uh, genetic variants that play a role in malaria resistance, and in particular, sickle cell disease. This is very common in people of African descent. It has been shown that this is due to a mutation in the uh, beta globin gene. People who have two copies of that mutated allele are likely going to die. This is fatal if not treated. But people who are heterozygote, meaning they have one normal copy and one disease copy, are actually protected against malaria. And that's really demonstrated here. When we look at the prevalence of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the parasite that causes the most severe type of malaria, we see it's really, that prevalence is really strongly correlated with the pre prevalence of the sickle allele. So here we have natural selection resulting in a high frequency of a variant that can cause disease. Now, this sickle cell has been under, underfunded, I would say, compared to diseases common in Europeans. However, there has been a success story. There was a genome-wide association study that was done and identified a gene, um, let's see, BCL11A, and this gene regulates the expression of, heme of uh, fetal hemoglobin. So people have naturally occurring variants that increase ex expression of fetal hemoglobin, and even if they had that sickle cell mutation, their phenotype's not as bad. So people are actually now developing genetic editing approaches. They may be able to cure this, but the problem is that's not going to do us any good in sub-Saharan Africa. We ultimately have to have an inexpensive therapeutic, and this is actually something that Gerd Blabel here at Penn is working on actively. The next example is a gene called APOL1 that's common in West Africa. And uh, genome-wide association studies found that this was associated with kidney disease in people of African descent. This plot is showing you that um, kidney disease is very common in African-American populations relative to other populations. And this particular, these variants that they found, if you have two copies of these, you have up to a tenfold increased risk of getting kidney disease. That is a huge risk factor. And it turns out that these mutations play a role in resistance to the trypanosome parasite that causes sleeping sickness. Another example very similar to what we see at sickle, uh, with sickle cell anemia. The last examples I'm going to tell you about were two recent studies. One was done in the Inuit population in Greenland, and the other was done among Samoan uh, population, the Samoan population. And let me start with the Inuit study. So they found a very strong genomic signature of selection at some genes that co code for fatty acid desaturases uh, enzymes. These play an important role in metabolizing lipids, and they have a very high fat diet. They eat a lot of whale fat, for example. And it turns out they then used, looked uh, at a genome-wide association study and looked at how this variant was associated with different traits like height and BMI, and they found an association when they looked in European populations, they found that it was strongly uh, impacted height, yet they had never found this in European populations because it's so rare there. But in the Inuit, it's about 98% frequency. So that's how it can be informative to look at ethnically diverse populations. In the Samoan population, they have the highest incidence of obesity uh, in the world. And in the study, again, 
They found this gene that showed a signature of natural selection and was strongly associated with BMI. So it's a 1.5-fold increase. To give you an idea, people who have two copies of the variant associated with higher BMI are on average about 18 pounds heavier. So again, that's a major impact. So in conclusion, our evolutionary history has shaped the pattern of genetic variation that we see. The prevalence of non-communicable diseases differs in ethnically diverse populations. It is absolutely critical that genomic studies must include ethnically diverse populations. And we must distinguish both genetic and environmental factors that are influencing health disparities and they're interacting together. And ultimately, we want to develop better uh, personalized medicine approaches. And I will just end by thanking the many people who contributed and pass it over to Dorothy. Thank you.